good day everyone, it's Warren here from NQ Explorers and NQE Overland with a 15 year ownership report on the Land Rover Defender. Let's get into it. Okay, before we get into it I'll uh, go through uh, my ownership of four wheel drives um, over the years. Um, if you don't want to just listen to me talking to the end um, and you want to get into the nitty gritty, uh, the walk around, uh, internal, engine, um, and any issues we have with it and what we love and we don't love about it. Uh, I'll put some time codes up on the side here so you can skip this uh, introduction which may turn into a rant at some point, I'm not sure. Um, we started our four wheel drive journey back in the uh, late 1970s. Uh, Colin and I were both in the uh, RAAF and the first vehicle we purchased was a second hand uh, Suzuki LJ50 two stroke four wheel drive. Great little four wheel drive. We'd been uh, camping and uh, hiking and exploring um, for years and Colleen had a uh, Toyota Corolla at the time. It wasn't really suitable for what we're doing. It was just the two of us, uh, a little LJ50 Suzuki, a uh, Labrador Cross and a two-man tent. We were in WA at the time, went all over the place in that little Suzuki. That was awesome. Uh, after that, we moved on to a, uh, well what happened with the Suzuki was it basically rusted and fell apart around us, they were notorious for rusting, um, especially in a maritime sort of a climate. Next vehicle we purchased was a Daihatsu uh, F10 four wheel drive. Uh, we used to uh, use that for the same sort of thing, exploring and uh, camping, adventuring, a bit of snow skiing, uh, it was handy getting up into the mountains, we were in Victoria at the time. Uh, still in the Air Force. Uh, the problem with that vehicle was that someone, had, it was second hand, someone uh, in its history had uh, done an engine conversion, removed the Daihatsu engine and put in a Ford Escort 1.8 litre petrol. It used to chew fuel like you wouldn't believe. Didn't really matter in those days because no one cared what fuel cost, you just filled the car up all the time. Not like now. And uh, it was pretty heavy on fuel but it was a great little four wheel drive. We had that for a few years and we thought, look, let's just get a new car, we'll do a, we want to do some long range touring, heading up into North Queensland, that kind of thing. Um, we're still in the Air Force, but Colin's family was in North Queensland. We used to go there, for, you know, once a year on leave or whatever. So we took the big step and we bought a poverty pack Toyota FJ, a uh, HJ60 diesel, 2H diesel, brilliant motor, bare bones vehicle, ladder frame chassis, uh, two live axles, leaf sprung. Um, Really uncomfortable, but what a great truck. We had that for a long time. Uh, went all over the place with that. You could sleep in the back. We had uh, had it kitted out with the AOB rack and bar. Um, I remember at the time, it was an 83 model and it cost us $18,000 new. It was brand new. That was a lot of money. I think Toyota gave you a one year warranty at that stage. And uh, But you know, it was a Toyota, it was reliable. We were on the Toyota road then. Uh, we had that for 14 years and then we moved on to a, when the Prado came out, uh, we had a young family at the time, we liked the look of the Prado, the 95 series um, with the three rows of seats. So we got one of those new, traded in the 60 series, actually made money on that as you do with those old four wheel drives. Um, the Prado was the first release of the 95 series, it was a V6 petrol, not ideal. We bought a camper trailer and towing it used to use a lot of fuel but once again that didn't really matter. Um, great four wheel drive. Uh, used a lot of pros for a lot of prospecting, adventuring, um, going camping with the kids, that kind of thing. Uh, kids grew up and left home. Still had the 95. Um, it was getting a bit long in the tooth and we were starting to have a few issues with it, so um, we bought a Defender. Why would you do that, you ask, when you'd been a Toyota owner for all those years? So we've owned four wheel drives for 42 years now, and for the last 15, we've owned this Defender. Now I've always wanted a Land Rover, I've loved Land Rover since I was a little kid. Um, uh, when I was in high school, we, uh, I did the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme and uh, my best mate, his dad had a, a long wheel base uh, Land Rover station wagon. I'm going to say it was a Series 2, it probably was. This was the early 70s. And uh, it had the bench seats in the back and you could put a ton of kids in it and all their camping gear and backpacks and things and off you went. Loved that thing. Uh, I thought, yeah, this is this is what I want, some kind of bush vehicle. I like the look of it, a little bit military looking, rugged, no frills, nothing in it. It's just a ladder frame chassis, two axles and a couple of seats. Um, 
that was where I started to really, uh, my love with Land Rover, but I didn't own one for a long time until I bought this. So this vehicle here is an 07 Puma engine. It's a 2.4 uh, four Ford diesel. Uh, this was the second last model produced. They went to a 2.2 after this. This is an 07 model. We bought it. It was just over 12 months old with 20,000 kilometres on the clock. And we're nearly up to 200 now. It's 190 something thousand. Um, and we love it. It, it, it. I'll just clarify what, what I... My, my need for a four-wheel drive isn't to go four-wheel driving. Uh, I'm not I'm not the kind of bloke that goes to the Land Cruiser Mountain Park to see what I can do and what my what, what truck can do. I just don't do that sort of thing. It doesn't interest me. I love four-wheel driving, but I, there's a, always a purpose to it. This is a tool that gets me to these sites we love going to in remote outback Australia, um, in our metal detecting videos and exploring videos. You know, old gold camps, getting around the gold fields. Um, a lot of the time you don't need a four-wheel drive, but you need clearance, and then. Occasionally you get a big storm and you need a four-wheel drive <laughs> or you're not getting home. Um, we tow a 1.6 tonne caravan with this with no issues at all. Um, the Defender's rated to 3.5 tonnes, but I just like the feel of a ladder frame chassis that's bolted to a tow bar. <laughs> Two live axles, it's got coil springs. I've had them upgraded, but I'll show you that in a minute. And uh, as far as reliability goes with this diesel, we've had one issue in 15 years. One issue. Uh, now any vehicle this age is going to uh, have parts wear out as part of the attrition but uh, we have one major issue where we were, were stranded by the side of the road. I'll tell you about that in a minute. So um, that was our four-wheel drive journey. That's how I arrived at. I always wanted a Land Rover. looked at Discoveries. Do not like the new Defender for all sorts of reasons. I mean I can't remember was it Richard Hammond said uh, the new Land Rover Defender is the best Discovery Land Rover ever built. Well it's not it's not a defender and you know I've, the defender the, the land rover purists that have run around in a series vehicle or a parenti all their lives probably don't regard this as a true land rover but it's the last of the line and uh it looks the part it's got unfortunately it's got some modern electronics and that's the one thing that gave me trouble but anyway we'll get into that in a minute but uh for a tool that i use to make my YouTube videos and just for recreational purposes generally, it suits me down to the ground. It's brilliant. And it looks a million dollars, in my opinion. Um, but you either love or hate them. I mean, everyone, if you're watching this video, you're a Toyota owner and you say, why in the world would you own Toyotas for 25 years and then buy a Land Rover? Well, this is the reason. Anyway, let's have a look at the vehicle. I'll do a walk around and show you the accessories on the outside. I'll show you on the inside. Now, I'll forewarn you now. Uh, I wasn't expecting you come in and look at this today, so I haven't cleaned it. It's not washed inside is how it is all the time um, I'm not big on cleaning the vehicle inside because of the dust that we get in there And it's just pointless because it just comes back all the time. It's not dust sealed to cut a long story short um, It is how it is. This is my everyday vehicle. Um, I use it all the time. I use it on all my uh, Trips I tow a caravan with it and I've done a lot of off-roading with it. It's not a Turak tractor. It's done a lot of hard work and uh, like I said, I've really only had one issue with it. Let's have a look at the vehicle. We'll do an outside walk around. I'll look at the accessories and I'll show you the inside. Then we'll have a look in the engine bay and we'll talk about some of the uh, issues you might have and the things that I've had to replace. Okay, there she is. It's 07 uh, Defender Puma, as they call them, because it's the Ford Puma engine. Uh, 2.4 litre common rail diesel with uh, turbocharger and intercooler. Uh, out of the factory, it had, it's got aircon, um, and it's got no safety features. <laughs> it has got ABS braking, and that's it. There are no airbags, there are no child safety points, you can't take your little tackers around in it. Um, it's all adults, and it's just uh, basic motoring. And that's what I love about it. In fact, it's too complex. It needs to be simpler. I need to go back to a, a series vehicle or a, a Parenti. But anyway, let's have a look at it. Okay, so there are some accessories on the vehicle, as you can see. That's a TJM winch bar and side bar and side steps. That's all steel. Winch bar, but there's no winch attached. I've not, I don't have an electric winch. I don't really want to cut around all that weight and the dual battery for something I'm probably never going to use because I'm... Uh, 
I don't like to get into the situations where I might have to get winched out. I know you can't avoid that sometimes, but I've got recovery ve uh, gear in the vehicle. Uh, I've got rated shackles and snatch straps, um, but I do not have a winch. For years I've been looking at uh, buying a, a turf or a come along sort of wrench, but I haven't got round to it. To be honest, I've never really got stuck in the vehicle where I'd need to be winched out. I usually turn around and go on home long before that happens. Like I said, I'm not a four wheel drive for the sake of it. Let's see if we can get through this mud puddle kind of situation. Okay, so we've got the TJM gear. It's got a safari snorkel. Uh, that roof rack is uh, is a four wheel drive super center cheapie. Um, on this side, I've got a two by two June on the driver's side, a two by two June awning. I think that's Anaconda. I've got that on sale. And on the passenger side where I'd normally sleep with the swag, I've got a uh, four-wheel drive super center 2.5 by 2 awning. So when the vehicle's set up in a camp without the caravan, there's plenty of uh, undercover. Now the suspension. Uh, the suspension has been upgraded. I've got uh, a TJM uh, uh, shocks and springs. You can't really lift uh, uh, these vehicles very much because of the... Uh, I think you've got to put extra joints in the uh, in the front drive shaft, which I didn't do. So as you can see, I've got TJM uh, springs and shocks in there. Um, I've had them, they've probably done 150,000 kilometres. The original shocks were shot, so I, uh, it's, it's about a one inch lift. But really you don't need a lift to defend it. Look at the, I mean look at that, that's, that's pretty much factory, factory clearance you're looking at there. Um, up on the rack I've also got a, a jerry can holder and that's got a ratchet strap. You can we usually just carry water up there, not fuel. Um, I haven't got any long range tanks, it's just standard at 75 litres I believe, the fuel capacity. Uh, we've got a uh, Heyman Reese bar, the tow bar. You can see the trailer plug coming through there and I've also got an Anderson plug coming out to run the fridge in the uh, caravan when we're towing it. Um, and that's about it as far as external accessories go. Oh, I put the front mud flaps on it because it doesn't come inexplicably, it doesn't come with front, front mud flaps from the factory, just the back ones. Yeah, front mud flaps. I'll think of other things as we go along, but that's about it. Look, it's pretty much stock. Upgraded suspension, slight lift, um, roof rack, and a couple of awnings. The snorkel. Now, of course, I've got a, uh, a GME 80 channel UHF, and that's the uh, antenna on the bar. Uh, I used to have a second phone booster antenna when we had CDMA phones, and phones worked a lot better in those days out in the bush like this, but uh, I haven't got around to buying a digital booster for our iPhones. So, uh, we're actually worse off communications wise out west because there's just no uh, range on those digital phones. CDMA was a lot better, but anyway, that's uh, that's, begin that's starting to become a rant, isn't it? And we've got a couple of, I've got uh, ASP 100 watt halogen lamps. I haven't upgraded to any LEDs on there. I've got no LEDs on the vehicle, except the number plate lamp. <laughs> okay, well, let's have a look inside of the vehicle and uh, we'll see what it looks like inside after 15 years of pretty hard use. Oh, actually, as a, in addition to that last little walk around, you're going to notice the paint's peeling off the roof. Uh, not anywhere else on the vehicle. But uh, that paint shop, must have been a Friday afternoon paint shop job, so all the paint, I'm back to bare metal. And uh, on these Pumas, they're not all aluminium. Most of it's aluminium, but the bonnet's steel, the back door's steel because of the weight of a spare tyre, and I believe the roof's steel. I could be wrong there. I should check that with a magnet, shouldn't I? Because it doesn't, it's, it's, there's no rust in the vehicle anywhere. It's 15 years old. There's not a spot of rust on it, but it, look, that's because mostly it's alloy. Um, quite a light vehicle for its size. It's 1.6 tonnes, I think, uh, empty. Right, now, let's have a look inside. Righto, what have we got in here? Accessories wise, I've got a steering wheel cover, which needs replacing, obviously. Uh, issues I've had in here. Two issues really. One is that happens to all these defenders, the O7s. The gear knob just falls apart 
it goes all sticky and the plastic cracks and I got down to this stage now where you just got the shaft. You can buy replacements, but they're dear as poison. If you want to just put a knob on the top of it, you've got to remach you got to machine the thread on it, I believe. I haven't done that yet. I've just put a, this uh, canvas cover on it, which suits me, because usually I've got pretty dirty hands. <laughs> okay, we've got a uh, GME 80 channel UHF. Okay, that's just the couple of cup holders there, which are always handy for your coffee. Uh, it's got electric windows in the front. No issues with that at all. Just wind down in the back. Um, yes, it comes with air conditioning. Uh, personally, I'm not an air conditioning person, uh, and I usually drive around with the windows down, much to Colin's dislike and the dust coming in. I don't like air conditioning, but uh, that did cause me some issues because I had to replace the compressor, I think because the gas leaked out and uh, with a condenser or something, it was uh, basically the air conditioner broke down because it wasn't being used regularly and the seals all shrink and that kind of thing. So that was my own fault, really. Um, I know a lot of people run air con all the time, but I never do. Super, it has to be a super hot day for, for me to put the aircon on, but I'd still rather the breeze in the window. But that was one cost I had was uh, replacing the air conditioning compressor. It just broke down. I was just blowing hot air. We've got a Heyman Reese brake controller here. I mean, that's required in Australia for uh, um, ele the electric brakes on the caravan, obviously, or anything, any uh, trailer over, I think, 750 kilograms, but that varies... Uh, from state to state and transport department to transport department. Uh, yeah, a couple of cheapy dish mats, which I use all the time. Now, this trim, I'll just show you this trim on the other side, on the passenger side. Uh, the trim's all falling apart. The kind of plasticky, rubbery floor matting. I'd rather just go back to bare metal anyway. I don't know why they... I guess it was a kind of soundproofing. So if you have a look here, let's move this gear out of the way. You can see this trim, it's just all rotten, look it just all falls apart. I've ripped it all off here and I've peeled it off. Uh, this is the battery box in here, I've, and that's this is the kind of stuff, I'm just going to rip all that out just to have bare metal. Oh that was another accessory put on there, because this trim wears out and you're getting in and out here all the time, the seat box rubs away, so you, this plastic corner piece, I just got that on eBay, that was quite cheap. Just screw it, this is all aluminium, just screw a hole in the vehicle. I've screwed, I've, I've drilled plenty of holes in the vehicle, no issue. Won't rust because it's aluminium. But yeah, this trim on the transmission tunnel, it's all right, but the floor all fell apart and I just ripped it out. This is just an aluminium plate. You can take that up and see the ground through there if you want to. Uh, yeah, battery box. A uh, couple of seat covers, they're essential. Um, the original seat looks great underneath. Look at that. That's 15 years old. These seats in the Defender, I mean, you'll hear plenty of stories about Defenders being uncomfortable, but they are, they are really comfortable seats. You don't get a sore back, they're just the right uh, firmness and they're the right lumbar support. I love them. Uh, they're very comfortable. The rest of the vehicle may not be, but the seats are. Now, cubby box is great. You can put a ton of stuff in there. That's made out of plywood, real old school. It's just screwed to the, uh, to the floor. And what I did there was, I uh, because it's all plywood, I just got a thick piece of uh, marine ply and jacked it up about... Uh, Oh, about an inch probably, two pieces of marine ply, so that you can rest your elbow on this as an armrest because it was too low as built. So I've jacked the cubby box up a bit. You can get accessories that do that. The one thing about Defender is because they built pretty much the same style of vehicle for over 60 years, bolt-on parts and, and, and aftermarket stuff is pretty cheap and it's just abundant. There's so much of it that you can buy. You can bolt stuff on to your heart's content. Parts themselves aren't that expensive. Uh, even for the Ford engine, I've not found, uh, you know, for normal uh, wear and tear type parts, filters and stuff, they're, they're acceptable prices. They're not, uh, you know, exorbitant compared to any modern vehicle. Um, but yeah, I mean, all these parts, like that little seat, I mean, there's obviously enough market in the Defender world uh, to make those little corner covers for the uh, seat box. So that's the kind of thing you can get online. Um, other than that, I haven't got, there's no other additional accessories in here, just the radio and uh, the dish mats. Uh, these are the, this little net's handy, we've got a, we've got a pouch hanging on there and that's a, just a handy bit of net to put gear in. There's no door pockets in a Defender, so uh, that's handy for storage. Let's have a look at the back seat. I've got a detector in here, I'm going detecting ladies, so we've got a Milford cargo barrier. Um, 
this is just a luggage nearly used for any gear I put on the back seat there's only the two of us and the gear on the floor um, nothing out of the ordinary in here really it's just all standard uh, defender a um, couple of dish mats and that's it now just just be aware that I've, there are very well there's one uh, 12 volt outlet in the front there to charge your phone or whatever you want to charge a cigarette lighter so I've just put a couple of uh, dual USB outlets there there's nothing in the back at all as I said there's no safety features other than the ABS uh, it's it's got no uh, uh, child anchorage points anywhere I'm not sure if you can even fit them uh, and it hasn't got any airbags so there's no uh, issues with putting any kind of seat cover on it you like because there's no curtain airbags there's no front airbags there's nothing at all Let's have a look in the back. Love that door handle, that's the old series style handle. They didn't upgrade that one. Okay, you got a map pocket on there. I've got my Fossey King license in there. Uh, the drawer system is a King system with a King slide. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, I just got a bit of gear in here. Tools and various cooking gear and for day trips, that kind of thing. Um, first aid kit, anything you need you know in the bush we always carry a snake kit with us uh, I just put a false floor in there as you can see I've got a bit of alloy and um, marine ply with some tie down eye bolts oh, I just got some camping chairs at the moment I've got a fire extinguisher on the uh, cargo barrier not that accessible but when I'm camped I'll pull that out of there and have it on the ground uh, I built a false floor and just bolted I just drilled holes in the in the um, alloy floor bolted the false floor in and then just built that set up you can buy corp, uh, special draw systems for defenders of course but uh, this is just the cheap uh, king system which I've had no trouble with it's great that's been to hell and back it's been up way up in the conglomerates in the Palmer River low range four wheel driving it's been everywhere um, I've got a water jerry in there that we usually just for day trips for long range operations I'll put a 20 litre jerry can on the roof especially uh, in summer here in Australia you need a, a lot of water doing what we do uh, I've got an angle uh, 45 litre fridge there which is great um, I do not have a dual battery in the vehicle you can fit them under the passenger seat there's room for two batteries just but I have a uh, 110 amp hour battery in a battery box in a smart battery box and a solar panel I just strap that in there with a ratchet strap to run the fridge and I've got 150 watts of foldable solar um, so there's never any issues with the fridge you're like in the hottest summer's day you know, you've got 45 degrees out here and the fridge is just purring along and uh, with those solar panels no trouble at all keeping the battery topped up and of course you've got lights at night um, if you're camping somewhere I've got LED lights string lights I put around these uh, these awnings just roll your swag out there and uh, Bob's your uncle but yeah in the back that's about it like I said that's a Milford barrier that's rated to 60 kilo, uh, kilos but you really need that in a four wheel drive um, just going down a steep hill in the bush you don't want all this gear <laughs> coming forward and if you ever had a you know a crash stop or an accident well um, you definitely need a cargo barrier because this is usually packed to the roof so that's the uh, internals of the vehicle Okay, what we'll do now is we'll have a look in the engine bay and I'll go through some of the issues we've had and some of the parts we've had to replace. Right, let's have a look at the engine bay. Okay, we're in the engine bay. Um, Let's have a look at some of the things that I've had to replace that haven't left me on the side of the road. This I've replaced this twice, that's the heater control valve. Very expensive to buy that from Land Rover, but you can actually get it on eBay as a Fiat part because it's identical. I think it's in a Fiat Ducato diesel um, because it leaked coolant. Very easy to replace, just DIY. Um, otherwise, you're going to lose all your coolant out through it. For some reason, it's plastic, of course. I don't know whether they can make a metal one. It's plastic and uh, it, it weeps out the back seal. And so I've replaced that recently, but that's the second time in nearly 200,000 kilometres. Also on the coolant, the coolant cap 
can leak and you lose a bit of coolant around here I've replaced the coolant cap once again plastic and why do you put plastic in an engine bay a hot engine bay I don't know um, no other parts in here other than filters uh, have I had to replace the uh, the big serpentine belt which is probably due for replacement I haven't touched um, I did replace the air conditioner compressor as I said earlier when I was inside but the major item I had to replace and the one the most expensive part in the, in the whole engine bay was the computer the ECU in the back there I don't know if you can see it I'll take a shot of that for you uh, the vehicle started acting erratically it was uh, wouldn't start it would always go it did, once it was running it was fine but it, it was intermittent start issues new battery no dramas uh, with the battery um, and it turned out that it was a faulty ECU but it was one of those faults that were intermittent you took it to a mechanic and of course it never plays up when you're in the mechanics uh, bay he had an auto electrician looked at it and they did all the diagnostics and was found to be faulty now I believe that that ECU the original 07 ECU was faulty from the factory because I would get an intermittent um, sensor fault on the uh, traction control on one of the wheels and there was no issue with the because the traction control was working but it was the I was getting a fault light on, inside saying you got a faulty sensor ever since the new ECU has gone in about 18 months ago two years ago I've got no issues with any uh, false reporting or error codes and this new ECU transform, transformed the vehicle it drove, it drove like a new car like a, it, there's no microchips there's no I haven't chipped this up it's just a standard engine uh, normal uh, Ford software but that new ECU it drove like a new vehicle unbelievable off the mark like a Lamborghini but that's the only major part I've had to replace and there's a bit of a strange story to that the, the mechanic didn't want to replace it initially because the cost was so high I think they're about $2,500 for the part plus fitting and labor costs here in Australia are pretty high uh, so he didn't want to do that without being sure it was the ECU which was a good thing but I'll talk about Land Rover mechanics in a minute but okay he didn't replace it and then we were coming home from just out in this area I mean now I'm filming this and we hit a bump on the highway and the vehicle stopped dead the engine just cut out dead would not start had no had a weird indication on the instrument panel the fuel gauge and the temperature gauge went to full and the engine wouldn't turn over there's just nothing it wasn't a battery issue what had happened was there's there's a fuse under the driver's seat I think it was a 30 amp fuse which blew which controls the ECU and it gets the ECU talking to the vehicle because that's got to talk to all the injectors and all that sort of thing now I went, it, it, and that was the only time I had to flatbed the vehicle home it was only 10k from home went to the mechanic he replaced the ECU still didn't work the issue was there was a fuse that wasn't on the Land Rover wiring diagram that was hidden under um, some of the wiring inside the the loom in the uh, under the driver's seat now these vehicles are hand built pretty much and I think they're all different <laughs> for some reason my vehicle had an extra fuse in it that was not on the official Land Rover wiring diagram weird so he just uh, repositioned the fuses put them in a nice little fuse box now I've got all my fuses on display and I can see where they are I don't know why that fuse blew I think it had something to do with that ECU fault but that took a long time to track down it was one of those frustrating faults that was intermittent now this is the thing with this Defender it's got one computer and that was it and it failed I would hate to think with a modern Defender with its three and a half thousand computers what you could be up for in the middle of nowhere um, but that's the only time we've been left stranded by the side of the road it's been very reliable this engine I mean I've, you've got to maintain a diesel uh, religious uh, uh, oil and filter changes of course some people do them every 5,000 but I do them every 10 which is not even that recommended by Land Rover they've got some ridiculous uh, time on filters and especially fuel filters and the coolant too I mean I've replaced the coolant a couple of times that I mean the this long life coolant supposed to last eight years but it wouldn't run eight, eight years of coolant in a diesel engine that's working that's just my opinion but overall as you can see the engine bay is quite tidy I mean I don't clean this <laughs> bit of dust we've got no uh, oil leaks up here we've got some down below but um, they come from the factory leaking oil um, all the parts are original um, oh that's not true I did replace the water pump the water pump's been replaced so there's some been little cooling things I've done 
uh, the heater control valve. That's not really an issue, just don't use the heater, but that's you might suffer a bit in winter if you're in a colder climate. Doesn't matter in Queensland. So I let that leak for years and just never use the heater or the air conditioner. <laughs> just keep driving. Uh, the cap on the reservoir and the water pump. But I mean, that's I, I think that's pretty normal wear and tear for a vehicle that's 15 years old with nearly 200,000 kilometres on it. But let's talk about Land Rover mechanics. So I've got to say with Land Rover, when this was still under warranty, because it still had two and a half years of warranty on it when we bought it, uh, I will just say that my experience with Land Rover dealers was less than satisfactory. And I'll leave it at that and I won't say which dealer it was. They just weren't interested in uh, warranty work. They did do it reluctantly, but it took weeks to do anything or get parts. Now, I know it doesn't take that long to get, well, now it might, <laughs> the way the supply chain is, but parts are more available and they just didn't seem to care about doing any warranty work. I didn't, it wasn't a good experience. I recommend to you, if you're gonna buy a, a second-hand Land Rover, um, don't go to the dealers. If it's out of warranty, it's pointless. It's just gonna cost you an arm and a leg. Find a good mechanic, a, a Land Rover mechanic, and there are plenty of them. Uh, where I've, I've moved a couple of times, well, I've moved once in the last 30 years, but I, when I moved, the first thing I did, let's find a Land Rover mechanic who knows these machines, works on them every day, knows the issues that you might have, preventative maintenance. That's not gonna happen at a dealer. And the dealers are gonna char uh, charge you three times more. Now, with any four-wheel drive that you buy, your maintenance costs are gonna be higher. You're running two diffs and two drive shafts and all those joints and, and, and um, CV, uh, all those joints and you know, knuckles. You gotta make sure you, you keep your grease nipples greased. And, uh, but you gotta accept that um, a four-wheel drive is gonna cost you more money to run. Um, and expense, expense, services can be expensive. So in the last few years, uh, other than for major issues like the ECU, which I couldn't nut out myself, I do my own servicing. Filters are easy to change, dead simple for the um, oil filter, um, air filters, a breeze, changing the oils, everything's accessible, you can get under the vehicle without jacking it up because it's so high, um, no trouble at all. I had some trepidation at first because of the, I read online about the fuel filter because it's a common rail, high pressure common rail, turbocharged diesel that you had to um, uh, pressurise the, 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 the rail system when you change the filter or you get an airlock and blah blah but not the case, uh, just watching a few YouTube videos, all you have to do when you're changing the uh, fuel filter, and I'll show you where it is, it's in a unique spot, just uh, fill your new fuel filter with diesel and screw it on and crank it till she starts, no trouble at all. N doesn't even miss in my experience, so you don't need all this fancy service equipment if you're worried about uh, fuel filter changes on your Defender Puma. I'll show you where that fuel filter is now. Okay, here's the fuel filter, it's in the rear driver's side wheel arch behind that armour plating you can see it in there that's the fuel filter it's just got a little uh, keyway sort of uh, toggle that comes off and swings open like a door the filters in there you can see the fuel lines and the tanks in here uh, and it's sitting that way like a cup just fill it with diesel screw the new one on and crank her and away she goes so that's the fuel filter location well protected from any uh, damage you might cop in the bush and it's away well away from the engine bay so uh, it's a very easy change actually, the fuel filter. Okay, let's have a look underneath and see what's going on with the drivetrain. Okay, here we are underneath the vehicle. Now, you can see I've got a couple of oil leaks, but they're minor. It doesn't take much oil to drip to look like a lot, but it, it, I don't ever have to top the oil up other than it add oil changes. The back of the engine and the transfer case joint have leaked since new. Uh, that was leaking under warranty, and Land Rover just believed that was an acceptable... Uh, limit for a new vehicle but you know that's Land Rover um, other than that it's just a matter of keeping these uh, drive shafts um, lubricated you've got grease nipples and all the relevant parts um, I think I had to change a tail shaft bearing I can't remember I think I did but that was just not normal wear and tear um, just change your diff oils and keep your oil up to your uh, your gearbox transfer case and uh, just get under every now and then and have a look you can actually buy uh, additional bash plates and stuff but this is just all stock particularly for the fuel cooler which is on the chassis rail they do make um, aftermarket 
bash plates for the fuel cooler, which potentially, if you're doing really extreme stuff, could you know jag a stick and um, you lose your fuel. But I'm not really. Uh, I haven't felt the need to put a bash plate on my fuel cooler. And actually, I'd fabricate one myself out of checker plate. I wouldn't bother buying one online. That's the beauty of this thing. I mean, you can just drill holes and bolt stuff in everywhere. I mean, look at the uh, build of this thing. It's just, it's a truck chassis. It is just robust. It lasts forever, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's pretty tidy underneath for a vehicle that's done 200,000 K and there've been hard kilometers. There's been a lot of heavy towing, so, uh, and, and off-roading and low range four wheel driving. Um, yeah, looks pretty good, really. The thing about a Defender is, uh, I guess people love or hate them. I don't think anyone denies it looks pretty good, but uh, you've got to have owned and driven a Defender to understand what it is <laughs> to love a Defender. Um, they're a very unique vehicle. I mean, in motoring history, there's probably only, with the longevity of this vehicle and this design, the Volkswagen Beetle, it lasted as long. I mean, they're iconic vehicles. And of course, Jeep is in there too, of course, the original four-wheel drive. But there's just something very special about uh, this vehicle and yes it's got plenty of faults you've got to live with a lot of things to love this vehicle but once you can get past all that they become a part of the relationship you've got with it you listen to all the noises and the rattles and squeaks and that's all fine you get in a modern vehicle and it's dead silent and that's really unnerving so uh nothing better than you know low range down a bush track with all the windows open smelling the eucalypts and crossing those creeks it's just a brilliant vehicle and you know you're going to get home in it because it's so capable Okay, well that's my 15 year ownership report with a Land Rover Defender. I love it. Uh, in all those 15 years, it's let me down once and I've had to get flatbed at home. Um, so reliability has not been an issue um, because I've kept that little diesel maintained. It's not a two-rack tractor. It's done a lot of hard work. It's been all over outback Queensland. It's been through Sydney CBD and up in the uh, up the Cape York. So it's, it's never, it doesn't owe me anything. Um, I think the vehicle cost me $44,000 when I bought it. I could probably get more for it now. Now, don't forget, these they stopped building Defenders, the 2.2 version of this, um, in 2016. So the newest Defender you can buy is six years old. Uh, just be prepared, like I said, once you're out of warranty, because they're all out of warranty now. Um, get yourself a good uh, Land Rover mechanic. That's not to say you're going to have trouble with it, but you just need someone who can do the preventative maintenance so that you don't have trouble with it. Um, and I was a long-term Toyota owner, and I understand uh, why people buy Toyotas. Um, I love Toyotas. They took me everywhere. But I just wanted a Defender, and uh, that may seem illogical, but I did it anyway. And I've loved it. I've never regretted it. Um, I don't find it uncomfortable. I love the uh, I love the noise. <laughs> I love the harsh ride. I love the fact that I can just drive around with my arm out the window and no air conditioning if I choose. Uh, I guess you can do that in any car, but you just about have to do it in this. Dust ceiling is abysmal. Um, the, uh, the best solution to dust sealing is just open the doors when you get there and let the dust out. Um, Colleen's not a big fan of that, but she just wears a scarf uh, and we're in that situation. But it's, 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 it's clearance out of the factory, it's ramp over angle, it's approach and departure angles are second to none uh, for a vehicle that's had its stock, pretty much. It's got a two inch lift, maybe, uh, not much. I've, I've upgraded the suspension and the original suspension wasn't bad. The shocks were pretty average, but these, this TJM suspension is great. Get a good suspension, you know, ARB, TJM, that kind of thing. Um, you need the bar work. When you get your suspension upgrade, make sure they take into account the weight of the bar, and especially if you've got a winch, so that you get the springs to uh, accordingly. Um, maintain your filters and fluids. Do it yourself. It's not hard. The one thing that was slow, stopping me doing it was that fuel filter issue. I, did, I approached that with a lot of trepidation, but I had no issues at all. So I can, I can do all the servicing myself. Obviously there are some things that are beyond the backyard, backyard mechanic, uh, in a common rail diesel particularly. Um, but uh, just keep your maintenance up. Fluids, filters, grease your drive line, that kind of thing. Um, accept it for its, uh, its foibles and you will have one of the most capable four wheel drives on the planet. You can just go anywhere in this thing. And uh, to me, personally, this vehicle's abilities are far beyond mine. I'll turn around on a track long before this thing stops. And I've been in some gnarly tracks that I thought, this is pretty tricky. 
and uh, I've got through it. Um, out of the box, it's got the it, it's constant four wheel drive. It's got a centre diff lock. Once you're in that centre, you got your centre diff lock in, and you're in low range, you're just about unstoppable. It's got anti stall in first gear low, so you can actually get out and move a log out of the way if you choose to do. Well, a car's still coming. You don't even have to drive it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that, but um, off road, it's second to none. Like I said, I don't use the vehicle for the sake of the four wheel drive capability. I use the vehicle as a tool to get me to places uh, to explore the old Cobb and Co stations, the old mountain huts and all those wonderful old um, historic spots where we go metal detecting in our NQ Explorers YouTube channel. I'll put the link to NQ Explorers up the top if you're watching this on NQE Overland. But I hope you found that uh, helpful if you're thinking of buying a Defender which is like this, a proper Defender, the newest of which in 2022 is going to be six years old. Um, or like this one which is 15 years old. I've had no trouble with reliability. Um, I've had no trouble on any tracks that I've been on. Just, you know, you've got to have a bit of experience, but just pick your line and the car will do all the work. The ABS is very good. I don't really like, it's a bit unsettling with the, the way the ABS works, but just let it do its thing. Um, you only get a manual gearbox. It's a six speed manual. That's fine. I enjoy driving that. It's got a heavy clutch. Uh, if you're uh, your lady doesn't like driving manuals or she's uh, a bit uh, on the petite side, well, she may have issues with the clutch, but um, I'd like the clutch to be even heavier, really. Um, I enjoy driving the manual. Uh, it's a great, the engine's well mated to the drivetrain. It's, it's, it just pulls like a tractor. It's great. So I hope that's been informative. If you've got any questions about uh, any issues I've had with the vehicle or anything about uh, defenders, these Puma defenders, please leave a comment below and I definitely will uh, reply. And I appreciate you watching our video. Thanks for watching. I mean, this is motoring. I'm in six gear, uh, 100 kilometers an hour. I'm just pulling 2,000 revs on the engine. You can conduct a normal conversation in here. I mean, how quiet do you want it to be?